Hi, I'm Stacy Johnson with Money Talks News. Here's one of our best podcasts from the archive that you may have missed. Hey guys, and welcome to Money Talks News, the podcast. This episode, we're talking about managing a variable income. If you're on a steady salary, creating a spending plan is pretty straightforward because you know both what's coming in and what's going out every month. But what if you don't have that stable salary? What if you're one of the millions of Americans who do side work, or you own a business, or you get paid commissions? For you, a variable income is just part of the deal. Then there are people who depend on tips like bartenders, Uber drivers, servers, you name it. Even freelancers and gig economy workers can have difficulty budgeting and managing their money thanks to that variable income. So today we're going to tackle the subject of a stable budget with an unstable income. I'm Stacy Johnson. As usual, my co-host will be financial journalist Miranda Marquette. Hello, Miranda. Hello, Stacey. I'm super excited about this because, you know, I have I have been a service worker working off of tips and I have and I'm a freelancer, which almost feels kind of the same thing. Let's be honest. We're selling things. Um, so, <laughs> so, yes, I'm excited about this. I've done. Well, the I thing. haven't I'm had a, I haven't had a steady salary since 1981. OK, so I think I probably have everybody on this podcast. beat anyway. Listening in and sometimes contributing is our producer, Aaron Freeman. Hello, Aaron. Hey, guys. I don't think I've ever had a service job. You have work off tips. And I don't think we've really discussed too much about what it's like to just live off why, tips. Why are we devolving into conversation when I'm trying to introduce our guest here, okay? Hey. Today's <laughs> guest is Barbara Sloan, a former exotic dancer and the author of Tipped. It's a book about financial empowerment for service industry workers. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Stacy, Miranda, Aaron. I'm... I'm pumped to be here. We're so happy to have you. Now, before we start, we're going to start any second. But remember, folks, this is not financial advice. Make sure you do your own research. Consult your own experts. Make your own decisions on anything that you may hear here. All right. Now, let's go ahead and dive in. Barbara, tell me about your background in the service industry. Tell me about why you wrote TIP. Tell me about who you are. Leave no what, nothing out of one. Everything that's ever happened to you. Awesome. Here we go. Um, no. So I think everyone has these punctuation points in their life where, uh, you know, they're like, ah, this is where I can take this back to. And I think the inspiration behind this book and sort of my mission started in 2013. Um, I moved to New York City with my wife. I got two jobs. The first job was working as a bartender at Coyote Ugly. I don't know if people know that bar, but it's sure. a bar where you, yeah. you sing and dance on the bar, you hit your patrons, you get girls to take off their bras. It's a very good time. Um, so I was working there nights. And during the day, I was working on Wall Street for an unregulated firm that was part trading, part trading floor, part independent sales organization selling usurious loan products. So like loan sharking, essentially. Wow. It, yeah, it was a lesson for me on the markets, on financial services, how predatory they were. It was an incredibly toxic experience. And after our third trader was shipped off to rehab, I was like, I'm <laughs> I'm going to go back to bars and construction because that had been what my career had been for the last 20 years. And so um, I ended up leaving Wall Street and going and getting a job during the day at a construction company. It's actually the construction company that I now own. But I was employee number four and they tasked me with setting up an HR department and a finance department because they were growing. I had never had HR before, so I had no idea what HR did. And so for the first few months, I was learning all of these benefits for the first time and what they meant and how they helped the well-being of an employee. I had no idea what a 401k was. I had no idea what a paid time off policy was. I had maybe had health insurance once. Remember, I had spent 20 years in the service industry. And so seeing all of these benefits and safety nets that these employees were getting access to was one side of the equation. And then on the other side, I was working for these millionaires and billionaires on their budgets for their renovations because we worked for high-end clients and getting to have conversations with them daily about how they viewed money, how they budgeted for these very high expense items when it seemed like they had unlimited resources. And so it was these benefits systems, safety nets, coupled with this mindset and framework stuff. And I was like, oh, this is the reason that myself and my peers have not been able to build well. And for me, when I when I first had that aha moment, it just really turned into a, well, I better get my stuff together and I'm going to use all of this and start to figure out how to get my finances in shape. And then in 2016, we all know what was happening politically. It was a little chaotic. And I just turned off all media 
and I only listened to the sweet, soothing sounds of personal finance content, <laughs> podcasts, audiobooks, dozens of the personal finance Bibles. And I realized that I didn't see anybody like me, anybody who had spent their career in the service industry, made the majority of their money off of tips. And I was just like, how is it that in this huge umbrella of you know personal finance that no one is speaking to 5.5 million workers who work solely or partially on a tip-based income? And so that was yeah, kind of where that's this came just from. tips too, right? 5 million people just make their money from tips. And there's also people yep. who make commissions and all kinds of, or self-employed people like me and like Miranda. Yep. Now, well, you were also an exotic dancer. Is that right? Yeah. So my service industry career was really varied. Um, when I was 19, or sorry, when I was 20, I moved to California. I lived in a studio apartment with three other women. And uh, <laughs> I had gotten myself into some some debt, about $178,000 of debt to be exact at the age of 20, um, which we can totally go into. Um, and so I was dodging some creditors and I was only taking jobs that were paying cash. And that was sort of, it started with me answering ads on Craigslist for anything that paid cash. And so my history in the service industry, I have been a go-go dancer, a bartender, a pole dancer, exotic dancer. I worked in flair or I worked in like the fetish and kink community. I was a flair bartender. I was a coyote I, uh, <laughs> you, you name it. If it did, if it What's took tips, a flare I did What's a flare bartender? It. A flare bartender is somebody who throws bottles around and. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, yeah, uh, like, like that. Yeah. There you go. That movie. So you've done pretty much everything. I've not cut anyone's hair or driven a taxi. Um, but outside <laughs> of those things, yeah, I've hey, done the, a lot for tips. The day is young, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Who knows what you're going to be doing by the time this podcast is over. So <laughs> now let me, okay, let me ask you this question too, because I'm curious and I owned a bar, so and I'm, I'm familiar with bartending. Um, wh what, what percentage of an exotic dancer's income is from tips? Um, majority. All of it? Yeah. So it? the group that I cater to mostly is people who live on that $2 and 13 cents sub minimum wage which is anybody who works in a restaurant, a club, and in a bar atmosphere. And so the other thing to remember for these professions is that you're often having to tip out. There's additional expenses that are being deducted from those tips. So in club atmospheres, you're having to tip out your house fees, you're having to tip out your security staff, you're still having to tip out your bar. Um, in restaurants, you have to tip out your bar backs, you may have to tip out your host or your, you know, if there's a sommelier or, you know, whatever the context of your establishment is there's usually a portion of your tips that you don't get to keep. How variable is your income when you're in one of those professions? In other words, I mean, if, if I go to the same bar and I work the same hours, the same days every week, is my income relatively stable even though it's tip-based or, or is it just wildly variable? So over my 20 years of experience, I had years where I made $20,000 of income and I was traveling a lot and I had years where I made six figures. And it's really location dependent, it's really establishment dependent, and it's really dependent on the clientele that you're serving. Um, but the, the the upside is that if you're at an establishment for a long enough time, there are trends. You start to spot trends. And so when yeah. we're talking about people who live on a fluctuating income, that those are the trends that we're going to try to start to look for. Now, Miranda, you, how long have you been a freelancer? So I've been a freelancer since 2005. Um, but yeah, but I have worked I have worked as a as a food server. So I've done the you know, working on tips and everything. Uh, but yeah, I've been a freelancer since 2005. So that's a long time too. So yeah. I, I've been self-employed since 1981. Um, I was a commissioned sell, a stockbroker and then I've owned this business since 1991. So my income is, has been as low. In 2009, I think I made $30,000. I was trying to keep all my employees paid. And then there have been years when I made seven figures. So my income is wildly fluctuating. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, and, and that's really what we're going to talk about today, too. What, what do we do? How do we manage? And I've tried to do this, you know, especially when my income was really low. I was trying to budget, you know, because yeah. I was afraid of running out of money. So, um, it, it, so now I don't want to worry as much about it. But it's really hard to have this. It's easy to, to track your expenses, right? But it's really hard to know what your income is going to be. And it's easy to say, well, you know, just take last year's income and divide it by 12. Well, my income fluctuates. 80%. I mean, it's a lot, you know, and, and so it's really hard to know. So what, how do we start, Barbara, w when we have fluctuating income like that? What's the first thing we need to do? 
Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm sure those years when you were earning seven figures, my hope is that your spending wasn't anywhere near that level. So for me, when I'm talking to to people about living on a variable income, it's usually people who are low to middle income, who are those people who haven't been able to build in enough buffers and don't have any other levers that they can pull to like move things around, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So when I start to talk to low or middle income people about living on a fluctuating income, especially when you were talking about that seasonality to the work, like when I worked in club atmospheres, summers were clo- were super, super slow. Sporting event nights were super, super slow. But I paired my club experience with a sports bar so that during the summers I had patios that I could serve or I had games where I would make a ton of money and then I could go to the clubs when those nights were really busy. So the first thing is to spot trends. If you are working in an environment where it's seasonal, you can look at picking up income in order to offset that fluctuation. But let's say, for instance, that you're not, that you're just going to work your one job with this seasonality. You need to build in buffers. So for a lot of people in the service industry, holidays are a great time. Holidays are my favorite time, right? Everyone gets a lot of extra money during the holidays. This is when you build up your buffers. It's when I tell people to start creating their PTO policies. It's when they can build in their buffers or maybe start to like plug things into their emergency fund. The bad news for people on a fluctuating income, as you all know, is that it's not as easy to budget as if you're getting the exact same amount every single month. It's harder. And so first, like just know that it's gonna be a little bit more difficult, but you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to know this perfectly in order to start plus all the people you're working with are going for the same time slots yeah exactly exactly um when whenever i start to talk about budgeting i like to talk about my experience as a fetish and kink worker because the lessons that i learned in that community i think perfectly address budgeting what's Um, a fetish and kink worker i need i need details here i need the deets i have like for instance i have an OnlyFans for my feet yeah what what's that I have an OnlyFans for my feet. You do not. I do. You are the most interesting woman, and, get, and getting more so Barbara's every week. Barbara's the most interesting woman, actually. But <laughs> I, I, I think OnlyFans we're tied, for... Miranda. <laughs> I do have an right. OnlyFans for my feet. I think so, sure and that, that's what qualifies as kink. There's there's so many things that qualify as kink and fetish work, and so really for me. I did things as vanilla as working corporate events where I would pose in. Uh, latex with whips and pose for pictures for corporate events with people and you know whip them for sort of like corporate fun parties and I've done private gigs where I have been a master of ceremonies at an orgy I mean like it really runs the 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 the, the gamut but so yeah, we should hang out together I think <laughs> where where are you anyway Barbara what state are you in I, I'm in New York I'm in New York City in New York. cool All right, so the first thing I like to talk about, which Miranda, you queued this up for me perfectly. The lesson number one is only people who are into feet want to talk about feet. So find your people. When you're first starting to budget, find other people that are in the same situation as you and use them for community. You're gonna fall off the budgeting bandwagon. You're not gonna keep a budget. You're not gonna learn how to manage a fluctuating income if you don't have somebody else to talk to How do you find these people, Barbara? Yeah. How do you find your tribe? It's it's there's a number of places that you can look for this. The first thing I would do is start with your establishment. If you're working at an establishment, maybe host like an investing club or a budgeting club and see who shows up to that. Right. It's easier to do hard things when you have buy in from your peers. If no one at your establishment is interested in that, trust me, I had so many times where like it's hard to look like a hot girl when you're bringing a brown bag lunch to a place that only sells fried things and being like, can I get a little fridge <laughs> space here? Um, so you may not find anyone at your establishment. So you may need to join Facebook groups. You may need to find podcasts to listen to to kind of relate to people. You may need to go outside of your your typical circle to find that that community, but it's really important. And Facebook groups, I think, and and social media is a great way for you to connect with people who have like interests. That makes sense. Tailor your Facebook social group. medias. You have a, you have a Facebook well, group. Well, we have a Facebook group for for uh, retirement planning, which isn't. I mean, you guys are too young for that. But uh, and for my age group, uh, you're never have, too young for retirement planning. You should, I well, that is true. Retirement. Retirement. Yeah, that is true. All right. So yeah. lesson number two for the, budgeting. The things that you want most should be a part of your budget. Toys, substances. I only have one rule when it comes to budgeting. You cannot budget for a hitman. 
You can still <laughs> you can still hire one. You just can't keep records like that. So <laughs> I think a lot of people, when they think about their budget, they think about the things that they should have and not the things that they can have. And when you approach budgeting with this like, oh, I'm going to be this like great person who only spends $300 a month on groceries or whatever, it's just not realistic. And you tend to turn away from it and it feels too restrictive. So the things that you want most should be a part of your budget. That makes um, sense. Le- lesson number three, boundaries are important and they are your job to communicate them. Saying yes is how other people get what they want. Saying no is how you get what you want. And so oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And that's important for budgeting because otherwise, especially in the service industry, other people will spend your money for you. Let's all go grab drinks after work. Let's go. Uh, let's go t- to a different club. And hey, this person's working over here. Let's go do that. When you leave a a service industry ship, you leave a ship energized. Yeah. And so you need to burn off some steam. And so a lot of time that involves spending a good portion of what you just made on winding down. How do you keep from doing that? You have to build up an awareness. I think in our industry, we constantly make the wrong, we constantly ask the wrong questions. Would I rather go out or would I rather not go out? When you ask that question, then the answer is always, I'd rather go out. Of course. But if you ask yourself, would I rather only go out once a week, max out my Roth IRA and go to Mexico, or would I rather go out three times a week? Then you can start to see where there's some intentionality and you can start to make trade-offs based on your values. But it's not until you start tracking, which we're going to go into, <laughs> so you tracking your income and why that's so important that you get to like build that awareness. All right. So in lesson number four, which is my the last lesson, is discretion is encouraged. Fetish work, budgeting, same thing. Discretion is encouraged. Not everyone needs to watch you budget. Budget like no one is watching because no one needs to watch. Your family, your friends, they may not want you to start saving money. It may mean that you're spending less on them or with them or, yeah. you know, in 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 those peer groups. And so if you have new goals, that's okay. Don't expose yourself to unnecessary criticism or judgment, especially when you're just starting out. It, it, we've also been we've also been taught, or, or we've I've certainly read a lot that you should have a partner in budgeting to help you stay on track, just like you would if you were working out or something like that. Yeah. So, lesson number one was find your people, but find the right yes, people. That's true. And lesson number four is use discretion. Right. So it's it. Yes, you want to make sure that you're not talking about this with the wrong people and that you are talking about it with the right people. So 100%, absolutely. Finding community is a huge part of being able to be successful in this. Cool. And so you've done, I assume, you've done this since you've written a book on it, and it's and it's obviously worked for you. Is that true? I mean, tell, tell me about where you were and where you are now. Yeah. So for me, I'm a zero-based budgeter now, which I'm not sure if you've talked about this on this show, but a zero-based budget is sort of when you send money off into your goals and you spend what is less, what is left over. And so it's not that level of meticulous tracking that so many people dread and associate with budgeting. I I like to start everything with a definition. When you define budgeting, budgeting is just an estimate of what's coming in and what's going out. Tracking is usually the part that people really get bummed about and, and hate, but everybody should have a budget. Um, Because it's really just an estimate of what's coming in and what's going out. And in order to build wealth, you just need what's coming in to be a little more than what's going out so that you can invest the difference. Now, let's let's zoom in on that what's coming in portion, because we're going to talk about, you know, variable incomes. It's not for most people, especially in low and middle income, those people who don't have buffers and don't have safety nets. We're not talking about a variability range of like $0 to $7 million. There's trends. And so that's the first thing that you want to do is look for your trends. I'm married. Estimate your income, you mean? Estimate your income. So I'm married. I'm very lucky to be married to um, a financial planning and analysis expert. She does finance for, you know, publicly traded companies. And when I talk to her about what, how she makes a budget for a company, because companies are very similar to tipped workers and gig workers in that no two months are ever going to be the same. And yet these corporations always manage to plan and they always manage to stay in business and afford the things and the people that they have, right? So there's a lot of similarities between how a company plans for its expenses and manages its income and how a person who lives on a fluctuating income 
plans on their income and their expenses. The first thing is that you don't have to make a budget based on your income. You can make a budget based off your expenses. Most people do make it on their income because it's more regular, but you can make it off of your expenses. So for most people, I start there. Let's look at your expenses, right? Let's write down all of your expenses. Shoot, we don't even have to like look at them. Let's start with guessing. I like guessing because it's more fun because later on after you've gotten really good at this, you can be like, oh my God, I used to think that this cost this much. And <laughs> now you know, like it's, oh, now, now I'm much more tuned in and you can see your own progress. Yeah, you could be surprised at where your money's going. Yeah, and so those big corporations, what they do is they make a guess of what they're gonna spend and then they analyze it and they, and they go back and see if their guesses were right, right? So they guess. Yeah, that's right. That, that's what all of these big companies are doing at the end of the day. They're throwing darts at a wall, they're tracking, and then they're going back to see if their guesses were correct. And that's what people who live on a fluctuating income and who live on tips have to do at the micro level. Now, let me ask you this, yeah. Barbara. Uh, having owned a bar, and I can see, and you're a young person, I can see. As a matter of fact, all three of you guys are rel young relative to me. But this is, these are the people least likely to create any kind of a spending plan are people who are bartenders that are 23 years old. I mean, they're, I mean, actually, 23-year-olds, period, are not likely to make a budget, much less people who work in the bar industry. How, how, do you get, how do you get people to focus on what's important when they're that young and they're that carefree? Yeah, I don't usually start with budgeting. I usually just start with tracking their income because most people who are on low and middle income and on a fluctuating income, they don't typically understand how much potential they have. So like anyone I know who worked on tips, if they've you know, when tax time rolls around, they're like, I don't know, how much do you think I made? Or they'll throw a dart at the wall and be like, this one sounds great, or this is what I have saved to pay in taxes. So the first thing I have people do is just start to track their income. Just start to see, oh, this is how much I actually made. And then when you kind of realize, oh, well, maybe I haven't been the best steward over that money. And then maybe we need to dig in and see where that money is going. You know, so I like to kind of take it in small chunks. Like you're not going to turn your financial life around in, you know, overnight. It takes small steps. And so for people who are young and for people who are just starting out, just tracking your income alone can be hugely impactful. And then tracking your expenses, too, I guess. What what about things like putting aside money for re in a retirement plan? Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's it's hugely important. So and that's going to be hard to do, though. When you, I mean, if you're if you're working for a company that has a retirement plan available, that's fine. But now you've got to put aside money of your own when you're, you know, when you're doing things independently, and you've got to put it in an IRA or something like that. You got a, you've got to have an emergency fund. B, you've got to, you know, think about your own retirement, which which you're probably not tending to do when you're 25 years old, uh, either. But what, do, do you find it a challenge? I still like to have those conversations. <laughs> Yeah, it's so I'm, I'm actually giving a talk next month at the Economy Conference on financial legitimacy because people who work on tips, th they get so bogged down when they compare themselves to their peers who have all these safety nets in place. And they're like, oh, I'm never going to have a legitimate financial life. Why should I even bother trying? Yeah. And so you have to kind of get you have to work through some of that mindset stuff first. Um I think a lot of people in this industry also don't even realize that they can have a retirement account. They associate retirement accounts to be synonymous with having an employer provided plan. And so mm -hmm. sometimes it's just even telling people that they can have permission to have one. Um, so I absolutely start the conversation, even with young people, my coaching clients, about setting up retirement plans, uh, especially the younger you are, the easier it is. So you rough, coach people one on one? I do, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off, Miranda. What were you going to say? I was just going to say the Roth IRA is your friend. Yeah. yeah. Like, like the Roth IRA is your friend. I think that's one of the things we, you know, they're very easy to open. Like my son has one. Um, and they're just, they're very easy to open. Uh, you get, when you're when you're working um, in this, this industry, a lot of the time, especially when you're starting out, you probably aren't paying federal taxes anyway. So like that's, that's tax-free money that you can put. Not paying taxes? I well, like to I mean, call it a slight pre-tax benefit. And for all of your listeners, I'll just say it doesn't <laughs> yeah. It doesn't yeah. rise to an, 
to a felony unless you're not claiming more than 75% of your income. I don't want, <laughs> I don't know why I know this, but, um, <laughs> so, I, I, so what, well, what I guess what I, I should have been clearer in my language. What I meant is a lot of the time your, um, your income is low enough that you're not going to like, for instance, my son who works part-time, uh, while he goes to school, he does not have enough income that they would be charging him for federal taxes. So it, it has nothing to do with hiding tips, <laughs> but but, uh, but he has his Roth IRA. And so, yeah, so he puts it in there and he's putting in with after-tax dollars, but he'll have a refund. He'll be getting that money back yeah. because of his low income. Well, that, that is that one thing sense. I tell people when they become self-employed. Like, for example, a friend of mine's a mortgage broker. And boy, was he making money last year. Boy, is he making none this year. And so when people are going into professions like that, I'm always like, uh, you know, A, make put some money aside you know do that and b make sure you're able to pay your taxes because what people do is they'll make a hundred grand and then at the end of the year they're like well wait a minute i'm supposed to pay i'm supposed to be paying taxes quarterly and now they owe twenty five thousand dollars they don't have it you yeah know, so, so I, yeah, be I always careful. recommend people put 20 to 25 percent of their income in a separate bucket for their taxes and if there's anything left over you can use that to pad out your your emergency fund or any of your buffers that maybe not be, you know, padded out yet. When emergency funds are one of the first things I tell SIPs and, you know, gig workers, independent consultants to work on for people in the service industry, you have a power imbalance. You are serving somebody else. And so if you don't, if you're reliant on their tip in order to pay your rent or even get some food that night, then you're going to be a lot more willing to cross your own boundaries and maybe do something that's unsafe or not okay or not in line with the values of the establishment. Having that emergency fund puts the power back into your your court. It almost changes every aspect of that job for you. And it allows you to earn money in a way that is according to your values. So you can say, actually, I'm going to kick this guy out of my bar. I'm going to kick this guy out of my club because they're not being respectful or they're not, you know, abiding by our rules. And so Emergency funds are not only super important for gig workers, but they're really, really important for people in the service industry. Yeah, I could buy that. And, you know, another thing, too, is these are these are kind of decisions that you need to face when you start doing this in the first place. I, and I know some people are they're becoming a bartender for, you know, whether in college or whatever. But, I mean, if you're going to approach this as a career, like being self-employed, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my wife's mother, who's my age, uh, is a retired school teacher. She just retired. And guess what? She's getting an income, but close to her, what she was making was as teacher for the rest of her life. And you know what my income is? Whatever I can squeeze out of the savings that I have. Right and, you know, and, and I couldn't be, I mean, I haven't had a salary since 1981, you know, 40 years. So I, I couldn't get, I mean, it, it had to be huge for me to get a salary. I don't want to know how much money I'm going to make. But there is a downside to that. I, that. My security is way less than people who have salaries and especially people with pensions. And it's the same thing when you're a gig worker or like you, Miranda, as a, as a freelancer, I mean, you know, nobody's going to come. We got Social Security, but nobody's going to come along and give us a pension. And, and it's and and what you pointed out too, Barbara, throughout this entire podcast is that you've got extra hoops to jump through when you're self-employed like that, right? No matter how you're self-employed, it's harder for you to budget when you don't know what your income is going to be. Yeah, and, and, when, and, and it's not always in your control. Yeah, and when you are a service-based worker. And you are typically not claiming your income in full because a portion of that is coming in cash tips or whatever, then you're not going to be on the receiving end of some of those benefits that are income dependent, such as Social Security, which is a right. par partial income replacement plan based off of what you claim. And so majority of solely majority of currently retired service industry professionals rely solely only on Social Security. Yeah. What, Miranda? Yeah, I was just going to kind of add to that, too, though, because as a freelancer, one of the interesting things uh, before my divorce was um, the accountant that helped um, me set up my my partnership, my LLC. Uh, we had my my ex-husband as like the junior partner in this, but we assigned most of the uh, most of the uh, income from the business to flow through him on paper. Well, what that meant for me was it meant we had great tax savings from the self-employment tax for several years, but my Social Security earnings and credits were very, very low. And uh, I've only started recovering from that now that I have now that the divorce is final and I am, you know, 
paying the taxes separately. And now I'm an S corp and I pay myself through payroll. So now I'm getting all of the social security credit that I need. Uh, but like, but having that as a as a thing, as an LLC, as a partnership, and and that's one of the things you need to watch out too if you're married and doing this sort of a, this sort of work is if you decide you're going to do this and on paper flow it through somebody else and try and save money on that self employment tax, what happens later? Yeah, yeah. I, I did the same thing. Go, go ahead, Barbara. I mean, yeah, sorry, uh, unemployment self employment tax. Sorry, that's self employment tax. I misspoke. The self if you're trying to save money on your self employment tax, like yeah, yeah, social security in other words. That's 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 not gonna you you know you're gonna miss out on your social security benefits later. Yeah. Yeah, you're screwing yourself on social security. You're screwing yourself on unemployment. You're screwing yourself if you need to get a mortgage and you want non predatory lending rates. You know, because uh-huh. they require two years of seeing a solid income in order for you to get traditional lending. Yeah. It's, it's it's really important to claim your income. I did the same thing too, Miranda, when I started this business. I mean, you know, when you start a business, I mean, I was I worked on a card table. I mean, I worked my butt off for many, many years. You know, and the and the the top of my list was not paying Social Security. It was keeping my business afloat. You know, so now I've got years where I had no so, no income as far as Social Security is concerned, but now I've tried to make up for that. You know, and hopefully I have to some degree. But th- these are all things to consider. I, and the whole point I was trying to make was, it's easy for me to look back now and think of the sacrifices, or you know, or, or rather put it this way: the advantages that 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 my mother-in-law teacher had. You know, with having a having a retirement, having a regular income, and all that stuff. Uh, and it's easy to look back now and see what the advantages and disadvantages that were at the time. I just wanted to be self-employed, you know. And I wouldn't make any, I wouldn't change it either. I mean, I'm glad what I did what I did. But there, you know, there are sacrifices that you make when you when you go into these types of jobs that pay cash or pay t- uh, tips or or pay commissions or things like that. You just have to be willing to work around it. I have a question. Uh, tipping is actually kind of a contentious thing here in America, and a lot of people don't do it. Um, what advice do you have for workers to squeeze tips out of people that don't believe it? <laughs> I mean, because you can't save anything if you don't squeeze the money out of these people. I think if you're um, an exotic dancer, you probably got a leg up on that. Wow, well, literally and figuratively. Yeah, I'm not sure where <laughs> I'm not sure where all this vitriol is coming for for tipping people. Tipping has been around for over a hundred years. It's been a standard in our country. It's based on some really problematic history, which I talk about in the book. Um, but it's how people make a majority of their income. Like service work is a two-part contractual compensation agreement. Part of your wages come from your employer, that $2.13. And then the part comes from the guest because they're having a subjective service experience, which only they can gauge. And so they're responsible for tipping because they're the only one receiving that subjective experience. Most of tipping is involved in luxury services. So if you're somebody who's in a low income or, you know, poverty or middle income and you just can't budget for tipping, then you don't need to be in service based establishments like you don't need to go to bars, restaurants, clubs or, you know, massage parlors. If you can't afford to tip, you can go to the grocery store, you can have picnics, potlucks, you can do all of these things. You can make your own coffee. Um, And so I'm not sure where where all of this hatred is coming from, but I definitely don't think that it's on the workers to have to try to educate people during the shifts that they're trying to make money on tipping and so for me that's part of the mission is like you know, I I'll, I'll tell you Barbara I've heard people recently I live in South Florida and there are two things one is when you when you're near the ocean a lot of places put the tip on automatically and that ain't right you know it, it, well what happens not I'm not, nothing's universally true but what what can happen is now I've got crappy service because I'm already paying 20 percent when I sat I down t- I totally agree with you I don't think like some people are like, oh, we should do away with tipping. This is terrible. And I'm like, OK, well, let's go back. What were the two industries that were tipped industries that now one has done away with? Railroad workers. Railroad workers used to be tipped. I didn't know that. When is the last time you had an amazing experience with a railroad worker? <laughs> never, never. <laughs> yeah. But the reason it's so important in service based establishments is because you need that dynamic of okay, I need to turn on the charm. I need to turn on the service. I need to turn it on in order to receive this this tip. And when you talk to the workers in this workforce, you realize that they like that risk versus reward, that they enjoy that there's no no top limit to what they can earn. They like that they can work more, to make more. They like that they can excel in their skills in order to generate more income. 
Um, what needs to change in our industry is that two dollars and thirteen cents sub minimum wage. That's absolutely abhorrent. Yeah. Like that's yeah. that needs to change. I have a policy wish list which we can go into. Um, but um, what I like so to say. So that's the one thing. It's out of step then. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I just had I just had uh, dinner with friends from Norway last night, and you. And no, I'm sorry, night before last, night, you had dinner with them last night, right? Yeah, and, we did. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, point, and I asked them, you know, because we had bad service, uh, and I said, what, what's the deal? Cause, and, and a lot of Canadians also vacation at the end of you know, r- real near where I live, and they don't tip. You know, a lot they, of people from Europe don't tip, and I asked these guys, the Norwegians, I said, do you guys tip? Because yeah, we tip a little for exceptional service, but the people get paid. You know, they don't get paid two dollars an hour. They get paid the same as the kitchen staff gets paid. So it's just, you know, it's, it's uh, the customs are different. And, you know, and a lot of people, too, I've heard complain. Now, I'm a big tipper because I own a restaurant, you know, and, uh, so I'm, I'm all about it. But there, a lot of people, I've heard people whine, it used to be 15%. Now it's 20. What what happened? That's a 33% increase. And I'm supposed to, and if I don't pay 20, then, then they, they look at me with daggers. So what when did it become 20 from 15 yeah, I mean, I think that there's a few reasons that that standard has changed. I think some of it has to do with inflation. Some of it has to do with the fact that that $2.13 subminimum wage has not been adjusted since the 1960s, whereas minimum wage has had increases, I don't know, like at least a half a dozen times since then. Um, th- we are realizing that these workers, these this 5.5 million workers, age into the most economically disadvantaged people in our population. They're the only people still falling through all of the safety net cracks. And so I think that standard being increased is because we need to help these people. These are the people, you know, I, I think the key, I think of the service industry as a keystone industry. It is the backbone of our economies and our communities. It, I don't know if any of you are into real estate. I'm a real estate investor. Um, it, those service-based establishments prop up my real estate valuations. They prop up all of our real estate valuations. And so I think it's very important to support the workers who really carry this 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 industry. It's the second largest employment sector in the United States. Yeah. It's so you know, I'm I'm very I'm very proud of of these workers, and and I would I would love to see some some changes policy wise to help them out. But so I often get into also Facebook debates about. Tipping. And actually, I just remembered something in California. There have been some places, including I think one of the most um, recognized restaurants in the United States, whose name eludes me right now, French Bakery maybe in L.A., where they've stopped tipping at all. And in other words, they raised their pay of their of the servers. And yeah, there's no Danny tipping. Myers. Danny Myers did that for a few years here in New York City and then recently went back to tipping because oh, really? they realized that yeah they realized that it benefited the the restaurant it benefited the employees they, they and they're one of the most successful restaurant groups in the country and they've tri- and if they can't succeed without it right like then I'm I'm not sure um, but I know that I listen to the workers and I talk to the workers and what the workers want is an increase to their sub minimum wage and they want to keep tipping around that would make and sense they enjoy it. I'm all yeah. for it and you know yeah. what? I appreciate these tips on tips. Uh, okay, so, now, now we're going to have to we're going to have to close it. I think. Let me look at my watch. Oh no, we're way over. Um, yeah. So, but this has been a really good conversation. And and I don't know if we covered enough detail for those of you out there who are actually living on a variable income. But the important thing, all you really have to know is to get is is to get Barbara's book, which is called yeah. Tipped. But I'm going to go ahead and close this show out now. Unless anybody has something compelling that they have to say at the very end. Anybody have anything they have to say? No? I know, get okay. tipped. We're going to have a link to it in the show notes. There you go. That's right. Uh, so we are out of time, folks, but we are never out of topic. Dig a little deeper. You're going to find links to lots more info in our show notes. And remember, if your goal is to make more, to spend less, to retire rich, your online home is moneytalksnews.com. And don't forget to check out Miranda's online home as well. That is Miranda Marquit, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T.com. And if you want to visit Barbara, too, at her website, that is tipped finance.com tipfinance.com but we'll have the link in our show notes if you got a question comment or topic you'd like to suggest please tell us about it you can email us at hello at moneytalksnews.com and one final thing if you like what we do then do something for us subscribe to our podcast takes you two seconds really helps us so so if you like us don't just sit there show us and subscribe and that's my tip for today i'm stacy johnson (laughs) i'm miranda markwit Make it rain, people. Make it rain. <laughs> <laughs> and Barbara, thank you so much for hanging out with us. And everybody else, too. We're going to see you right here next time.